Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the Sam and Max the Devil's Playhouse commentary. I'm Chuck Jordan, the uh, season designer. Uh, I am Andy Hartzell. I w was one of the designers on the uh, on the season. I'm Dennis Lenart. I was lead cinematic artist on the season. And this is our opening cutscene. I have to call out, I was really unsure about the uh, narrator. We knew we wanted one for the season to call in the whole uh, Plan 9 from Outer Space and Twilight Zone feel to it. Um, but I was never quite sure if it was going to work out until I heard Kid Beyond do the uh, voice track for it, and he just nailed it from the beginning. Uh, so this opening cutscene worked on for a while. Um, went through lots of revisions, but uh, I think it ended up being pretty action-y, which is good. I think a lot of it, too, was uh, just written right into Chuck's design notes from the beginning of uh, seeing the ship floating through space and then cutting to um, Skunk Ape's eye pulling out. Crazy intensity. Yeah, I think I've seen uh, shuttle launches that had less uh, <laughs> revision and <laughs> redo than that opening scene. But uh, it was good to put all the attention in here because um, we did want to make it clear that you know this was the beginning. Uh, this was a good jumping on point for Sam and Max. Um, but also keep it appropriately weird because the whole thing with Sam and Max is that you just jump into weird situations with them. And it was also a good chance to show off how far uh, we come cinematically since the first two seasons and uh, just show off all of the uh, just all of the great acting and cinematography. Yeah, there was some resistance to this narrator. Wasn't it? it was kind of a, a little bit of a tough sell, like uh, the boring old English guy. Some people thought a boring old English guy was not was not something that the kids would would take to, but they did. Yeah, throughout the whole season, I got a lot of pushback whenever I wanted to do uh, a lot more with the narrator because he um, uh, because he just stay in there talking. It's hard to make his scenes interesting, but. Um, Actually, one of the influences for the season was uh, there was this 70s horror movie called The Beast Must Die that starts, he doesn't have an on-screen narrator, but it does start with this narration and it promises that, you know, right before the end of the movie, he's going to let you come on and guess who the, uh, the werewolf is. And it was just such a w great way to set the tone that I really wanted to make sure we had the narrator throughout. Ooh, I wanted to point out that uh, this little bit here, I just know it's a, it's a quick little thing, but um, Nick, who was uh, directing the first episode, um, like really fought for that <laughs> like little moment there. So the moment where the, it just, the Yeah, where it comes out, we go into his head, out. and it sort of spins out. Yeah, and this whole first section is just full of um, little moments like that. I mean, we knew, we knew pretty much from the start basically what was going to go on here. But there were just so many different versions of how exactly to sell it, and mm -hmm. it would just be—it was amazing to see, you know, one version to the next, the same basic stuff happening, but it just flowed so much better and made so much more sense. You're using the rhinoplasty. The whole thing with the uh, introduction was, uh, again, you know, we wanted to have a jumping point and uh, start off with a very easy puzzle to kind of introduce. The characters with a lot of noise and fury going on. Now our brain there was famously recast. The brain that you see before you is not the yeah. the original brain, but he's, uh, with that trigger, he's a finger, different personality. Yeah, we brought Kid Beyond in again, and he uh, again he just nailed it. But actually, I did want to point out that, uh, oh, well, first of all, the uh, <laughs> yeah. the opening sequence is just <clears throat> insane. <laughs> <laughs> Nick I and think, Jake. <laughs> I think they did this like over a weekend. Yep. J Jake kept asking, you know, can we can we make this bigger? And I said, all I care about is it has Steve Purcell's name in it, and, you know, it could just flash up on there. Um, and he's like, well, can I do more? And I was like, sure, you know, whatever. And for Jake, usually that means we'll have a, like a really, really nice composited something and then he showed it to me and I was like wait that's not done in the engine you you after you know you did all that in after effects or something 
but then he showed me all the files to prove that they did all that, and I'm still, I'm actually a little bit scared because I still don't know how they did all that yeah. stuff. Yeah, no, it was crazy. Uh, like you know, Friday night or whatever, then being like, all right, we're gonna do a title sequence this weekend, and then you come in Monday morning and it's that. And you're like, holy <laughs> cow! Yeah, amazing. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's yeah. This was this fun. Dennis's this, favorite scene. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this was really cool because it was right at the beginning of the project, and I think it was one of the first things we started on. And I remember. Uh, like I think I had an initial idea, and it, I don't know, it just wasn't that exciting. And then I just brought Chuck in, and we just sat there and started sort of going through the moments and just totally workshopping it. And it was a super fun process. And then I just remember telling Jared, I was like, "Can you just give me three parts where the music goes <laughs> dun dun dun, and I'll put him in front of the eye?" And it was fun and cool. Man, that tongue was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, so many times I said, you know what, just cut it. And I'm so glad that they refused to cut it because it's hilarious. It's pretty funny, yeah. And so is this. <laughs> yeah, Dennis came up with a uh, seeing Skunk Ape silhouetted in the, in the uh, spaceship eye um, all on his own. And it really does sell the, uh, sell the whole thing. I just said, kind of make it look like a cross between V and Zardoz. Yeah. <laughs> one of which I had never seen, which is Zardoz. <laughs> and the other one, which I hadn't seen for like 15 years. You seem a bit confused. That's what YouTube is for. Yeah, there's a lot of... Uh, you have to do a lot of YouTubing when your director is just saying stuff like, you know, kind of make it look like Plan 9 plus V. <laughs> So here we have a flashback within a flashback. What I did want to... Jake still insists that this whole bit uh, doesn't make temporal sense, <laughs> but it does because uh, the opening shot of the ship flying through space is actually while Max is having his first vision. Fun fact. <laughs> it's an IMDb thing right there. I just want to prove that yeah. we're, we are thinking about this stuff. <laughs> I'm sure there's theories on the forum somewhere. <laughs> One gaping, treacherous crack in the street, and those pansies from City Hall shut down the whole Do you see the crack? Do you notice the crack? You're going to use that in a puzzle later. <laughs> yeah, I remember this. It, at first, it didn't seem like a lot, but this opening bit with the flashback. Um. I think it was originally all on me, and I just halfway through doing the first part with Skunk Ape and the ship eye, I was just like, there's no way I'm ever going to get this done, so Nick um, okay, hopped in and did this half, which I think worked out really well. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, we just <clears throat> kept adding more and more to this cutscene. Um, because <laughs> yeah. again, it's always that, you know, keep it Sam and Max weird, but then also uh, make sure that if you're not explaining every, everything, you're at least making people feel comfortable that stuff isn't getting explained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny how many revisions that went through and how many conversations there were about that. And in the end, it just seems really natural. It yeah. just kind of works. Yeah, I think if you tried to draw a graph of all the different timelines going on at the beginning of this game, you'd be, uh, <laughs> it'd look more confusing than it really is. Yeah. That's from the, uh, the office ah, print line. that we used to sell, the uh, Sam Max painting that uh, Steve did. Get out of here. It's Sam and Max. <laughs> Great screenshot. Hi, <laughs> Harry. We were looking for Mama. I love the uh, I love the way Bosco Tech turned out. Uh, everything from the set design to the to the music. The usual thing with the music with Jared is like uh, I'll tell him something weird like, you know, combine the line of Space Mountain with, you know, mariachis. And this <laughs> one is, it's a little bit like Haunted Mansion plus Space 1999. And then you get a music track from him and it's like, you know, that's more like what I imagined than what I was imagining. <laughs> yeah, I gotta agree on that one. It's it's super scary getting stuff back from him, especially when you have, like you're saying, it's like some sometimes it's just a random thought. It's kind of like, ah, oh, we're like, imagine, you know, you got in a car accident and then you got covered by a truck of mashed potatoes and you'll come back <laughs> with something that you're like, wow, that actually does somehow sound like that. 
This is a tricky set to set up because. Um, so hard. You see, I've never seen oh, this is Nick's <laughs> favorite <laughs> cutscene. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> And then, boom, more science. <laughs> oh, man, I was so angry. I remember reading that in the script because I first, I think I was the first person to go through when I was doing estimates or something, and I remember looking through and seeing that line and going, like, I'm giving myself that environment so I can make that, and then somehow I forgot about it, and then two weeks later, uh, I, I watched Nick doing it one day, and I was like, no, did you get that one? Uh. Yeah, Nick loves the uh, Sam doing the surfer hand. <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't make the, the boom more science t-shirts. Yeah. Do not trust General Skunkafe. Ah, brain. Something's happening. Toys detected. Toys detected. What are you doing, brain? Uh, overkill with Dutch tilts and the Zolly effect. <laughs> yeah, this was the first attempt to bring the start bringing the creepy Cthulhu stuff into. Uh, Oh, there we go. I mean, what a pleasant surprise. <laughs> oh, man, some of those reads, I remember also at first uh, when we, like, because I remember at the, the beginning there was like, oh, weren't sure who's going to do Skunk Ape, and then, oh, is it pitched down too much? Should we pitch it up? Like, all this different stuff. And I remember the first time that we got the lines, and uh, me and Eric and Nick and a couple of people were sitting in, and we got the first audio drop, and we were just going through all the wave files individually listening to them, and we're just crying. We're like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> I think the one thing that didn't change from the uh, <coughs> first version of the storyline, I mean, the, the season-wide storyline went through a lot of changes. I think uh, Skinkape is the only thing that didn't really change because I kind of knew I wanted Roger Jackson doing the voice of a giant space gorilla from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, there amazing. were originally a lot more villains, and they kind of, he kind of assumed the main villain uh -huh. role for the season. inventory. Where do you keep your personal items? It's none of your damn business, computer. <laughs> I love the creepy uh, how feel that they gave to this. Yeah, that was pretty awesome. It's like just the right, I mean, you can instantly tell what it is, but it's not like an overwhelming reference. Or crying out. I had my skating Sam, why haven't we ever seen any mole people come out of here? The rest of your I really dig the effects on this part too. Scrow and Peretta. Yeah. Did uh, pretty awesome. I'm just going to refer to everyone by their last names <laughs> Michael Peretta and John Scrow. Ah, uh, the phone. Oh, here's this one. Oh, man. This was actually. Um, Steve Purcell's idea that I liked the most that I wanted to I said no matter what else this has to go in the episode um, where originally this had a lot more of going into an alternate dimension and Steve just to give an idea of what it's like talking to Steve Purcell he said alternate dimension alternate dimension and you mean like you go there and there's a bunch of skeletons holding sighs and their heads are on fire <laughs> like, yeah pretty much that's it <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, so uh, that plus the whole night gallery influence. Wanted to make sure we referenced a lot of stuff that the target audience was too young to, to understand. But <laughs> night gallery was indeed a show that was on in the 70s. <laughs> and the um, actually there was one pr specific episode of that with a haunted Cthulhu chest that basically inspired the whole season. Hey, you guys really should be literate. Trick in the book. See, one of my favorite gags in the whole episode is that there are actually pawns in the pawn shop. That shows you my level of uh, <laughs> humor, oh, humor it's, maturity. So it's those things that make Sam Max Sam Max. <laughs> Although the uh, uh, probably the title of this episode should give you the idea of my uh, comedic maturity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was um, uh, just a little bit about like the original version of this. Um, obviously, the influences are the Twilight Zone, and then also, of course, the Phantom Zone from Superman, um, and uh, also a dick joke. <laughs> and, uh, oh, I did want to say this. After after we got the. Uh, the design end for the um, for the penal zone 
Um, I really wish that we had more puzzles in here because originally you weren't going to see them at all. And then I said, well, we can just put them in a void or something. And then I told my, well, you know, just look at old, you know, references from Flash Gordon and, and we'll see if we can do anything. Just, you know, in the comics it was purple and th that was basically the, the extent of the direction I gave, which was it should be purple and look kind of like Flash Gordon. And then she delivered this environment just like in a day. And then I said, you mean like this? And I was like, uh... Yeah, that's the most amazing thing. <laughs> I remember, yeah, doing all that stuff and just being so bummed that the environment was rad and you didn't do a whole lot in there. I know it was originally planned to just be a quick thing. Yeah, so from now on, get the environment, see the environment first, and then design puzzles in it. <laughs> and the chase sequence. The chase sequence has caused no end of nightmares for Eric Parsons yeah. and Dennis and Nick. Yeah, I think it went through, and Daniel worked on it for a time. I think this was like the one thing that was sort of always being worked on in the background. I'm happy with how it came up, though. I think it's a lot yeah, more cool. uh, action-oriented. Um, mm -hmm. And it does actually have a little bit of that Children of Men feel that y'all were talking about, having the shaky cam yeah. following you around. <laughs> uh, Mole Man cultists, amazing. That's uh, Kid Beyond and uh, William Caston again, the, the voice of the narrator and Max. Uh, excuse me, I'm pretty sure you mean Tablet 6 verse 24. Heretic! Looks like another in a long line of wacky... Wow, they're Star Wars nerds. <laughs> we should start charging royalties. You try and entertain the other wing nuts while I find a way to power this thing up. Stinky. Hey, Brain, can you give us a hand here? Maybe cause a subtle yet stylish distraction. I throw weak Japanese. Yeah, this one, the, uh, <laughs> the brain slowly starting to lose it. I think it was played up a lot more before. Um, but it ended up that once you got back on the ship, you didn't really spend a lot of time wandering around. And so you really just have like a little dialogue with him. Uh, I hope it still came across that he's basically. Uh, just used himself up trying to power the ship. Emergency. Is that what it is? Failure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, I think that broth is starting to go bad. And here's where Skunk Cave gets sucked out of his spaceship through several layers of rock into a cavern underneath the street. <laughs> Well All cleverly off screen. Yeah. The devil's toy box. Devil's toy box. That's right. It's interesting how much of this I haven't seen. <laughs> so that's where the devil's toy box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I get it. I was wondered why. <laughs> Yeah. I still could tell if it was clear that the uh, it was Skunk Ape getting sucked through the rock and everything. Or I'm, I'm sorry, it was um, Skunk Ape ship landing on Sybils that broke open the hole in the apartment to reveal the toy box in the first place. I did not know that either. We need one more flashback. To make that, <laughs> that was the whole problem of this episode: is there's not enough weird time flashbacks. And that scares me, and I have nightmares <laughs> about it. <laughs> yeah, Nick struggled with that one for a while. Yeah. yeah. The reference there was uh, my favorite bit from the Hellboy movies is when they show him and you get a little bit of glimpse of him with the the flaming crown over his head that shows that he is you know destined to to take over Hell. So we wanted to have the ominous foreshadowing of that that Max is going to be the one to destroy the universe later on. Cool. And also the whole, his brain is going to catch fire and explode. <laughs> I think they're referenced again in 305. Yeah. Sorry to anyone who's still expecting Sam to find true love. He doesn't this season. <laughs> he did somewhere between episode 4 and episode 5. But right. It didn't work out. <laughs> it was true but brief. But for now, I leave you with this chilling. Did people... Another Haunted Mansion reference? Yeah. <laughs> did, 
Did people, uh, I forget on the, the forums, like, suspect that the narrator was, like, the ultimate villain? Yeah, oh, yeah, they yes. knew. Yeah. <laughs> they kind of expected that, that it yeah. was going to go, but they wouldn't know exactly what he was. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, because we did it with the first two seasons, as soon as we started this one, people are going to be looking for the, uh, who the main villain was. Oh, we so did our question. best to misdirect them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. When you uh, when you come up with those the crazy long lines, mm -hmm. is it just like whatever the first things come to your head? Is there like a process for those? Because no, I know they're sort of a big Sam and Max thing. It's a little bit of rant. They're all based on the original, which was the Holy Jumping Mother of God in a sidecar with chocolate jimmies and a lobster bib. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's it for 301, it looks like. And uh, we'll see you for the other ones.